thanks for having me. Um, so this is what we're talking about tonight, under or over screed waterproofing. I'm sure everyone's already got their, their own opinions on it based on, on certain things. Um, the interesting thing about this one is there's so much nuance to it. So I'm pretty confident that by the end of this, I'll have given you more things to think about next time you make that consideration about which is the way to go or any recommendations because of that. So this is actually uh, something about me is that I wear a few hats. So I'm also the president of the Waterproofing Association. So we actually developed this, myself and George Nicholas developed this uh, last year as part of our, our members thing. And when Joe asked me to come along, I couldn't think of anything better than to, to share than, uh, than this one. So let's jump into it. Okay. These are things we're going to cover. First of all, we'll start off with the dry stuff and, and then get into the more interesting stuff. Uh, first is going to be regulations. Um, then after that, we'll, we'll talk, uh, have some considerations about those regulations. Then we'll jump into case studies. Uh, then finally, we'll, we'll talk about, well, is what's the option for a dual system under Rando? We'll touch that at the end. Um, and, and then we'll uh, see if we can pose the, the final solution that, um, that trumps the entire argument. See what you guys think. Okay, so like I said, the dry stuff first, but bear with me, we've got a, quite a bit of ground to cover here. We're gonna go through these three points. Uh, where to find the provisions related to waterproofing? Um, is waterproofing required under or over the screed? And what is the full gradient required? So, first one. Okay, so first of all, we're gonna start out with, we're talking about NCC 2022 requirements. That's where we are now. We're not gonna look back into the, into the past. So here we've got our, for our internal wet areas, we have our AS3740, 2021 being the current version. We have, depending on whether you're volume one and volume two, and we will flip between both here. So if it's overwhelming and things go in different direction, don't worry about it. We'll provide all of these slides and you can digest it later. So volume one, F2, D2, and then volume two, you've got H4D2 and H4D3. And then on top of that, we also have our, our new reference document, which was introduced with 2022, which is the housing provisions, which elaborates on that a little bit more and gives an alternative um, as well as 3740. Okay. So. Just on the, the housing provisions? NCC 2022? Yes. Yeah, that's it. A3740 2010. Yeah, that's right. So what happened is before that, everything was 3740 2010. When the NCC 2022 came out, volume one referenced the new 2021 version of 3740 and volume two referenced both the new 3740 and the housing provisions. So yeah, it gets a bit muddy. We'll, we'll talk about those a little bit more in a, in a minute. Um, yeah. Okay, then of course down here we've just uh, we've got both internal and our external uh, standards. So we're also going to talk about internal and external, and they also have different requirements or, or different provisions. Okay, so just to deep dive on on each of these. So volume one of the NCC class two to nine we've got must comply with three seven four zero. If you look in the table at the back, that is the twenty twenty one version. So it doesn't say it here; it says it at the end. And then for external. We know we're looking at AS4654.2 external waterproofing standard. So that, that's a pretty easy one. Now when we jump into volume two, it starts to get a, a little bit um, more muddy. So here we've got AS3740 for internal wet areas or part 10.2 of the housing, housing provisions. Um, and then the similar thing when we're talking about uh, materials in there as well. So we've got AS3740 or 10.2.12. And the way that these are used together is very, very strange. So I don't want to go too much into this tonight because it detracts from our main topic. But the way 3740 and the housing provisions work together, it's not as easy as this one or that one. If you choose to use 3740, there are certain clauses of the housing provisions you also have to abide by. But if you choose to use the housing provision alone, you can do that without 3740. Okay, uh, volume two external standard is uh, 4654.2 as well. Um, so that's covered there in H2D8 for external waterproofing. So 
In summary, what are our requirements for waterproofing? We've got volume one and volume two for internals. We've got 3740 on the housing provisions. And for externals, we both have uh, 4654.2. So that's where to find the information on, on waterproofing if you're not already familiar with that. Then we go into the next one. Is waterproofing required under or over screen? So let's have a bit of a deeper look at each of those things we just highlighted and see what they show us. So first of all, we're going to start off with our AS3740. And we find that this is what we've got in part 2.3.1, where a floor waste um, is required. The membrane shall be applied to a substrate minimum 1 in 100. Um, so that's good. That's establishing that. And then we have this bit, which is really answering our question that we've got in this section, because we're not too much talking about gradients just yet. Where a tile bed or screed is used, the waterproofing membrane shall be installed above or below the tile bed or screed. So an important one there is the use of or rather than and or. And you'll have, I've got my own opinion on this, which I'll, I'll share. But some take that to mean that because it says or rather than and slash or, that you must choose one. As soon as you're doing two membranes, you're no longer complying with this anymore. So that's a bit of a contentious point in the industry. Um, and we'll, we'll cover that a little bit more further, further along. Okay, now this is just an, a, another interesting little accessory piece. So this is for cases where the whole of the bathroom is designed. So uh, something like normally accessible bathrooms or whatnot in, in aged care or, or that sort of thing. You can see this is the entire bathroom. It gives a little bit of guidance here. So it says if a screed is used, the membrane should be applied on top of the screen. So it's not a mandatory requirement, but it does make the recommendation that in this instance, put the membrane on top of the screen. Reason for that being is you now have, a, your whole room is the shower, right? It would be undesirable if you were to have that shower and your screed is able to saturate the entire bathroom every time, potentially from range of uh, amenity issues, as well as it just being cold and damp and unpleasant. So that's why they say they give that should, is because it will stop that from happening. So that's a good one to note. Now we go into external areas. Um, the fall shall be in the structural substrate formed or formed by a screed over the structural substrate. Um, there's the actual extract there out of 2.5.2. So it gives the option on, on where the fall should be. And that's because, I jumped ahead too quickly, that's because, again, it's acceptable to have the waterproofing under or over the screen. You, it's just saying that you need to, wherever you're having the membrane, make sure that it's shedding water at that level. OK, next one, favorite part, housing provisions. For the record, this is not my strong suit. I'm a lot more in class two to nine than, than class ones, so uh, bear with me. So the important thing here is that where a screed is used in conjunctions with waterproofing membrane, the waterproofing membrane can be installed either above or below the tile bed and screed. So it's sort of saying the same thing, right? No conflict there. That's nice. This is the part about what actually matters, right? Like how will we go? What are the considerations? What's going to perform? Every scenario is unique. And you want to, whenever you're making a decision, and this is obvious, you want to be well-educated on all the possible considerations rather than this narrow pool. So what I've put together here, and we've got a lot more photos now, is uh, guidance on each one of those. So first consideration you want to make is substrate stability. Waterproofing membrane performance um, is very tied to, especially with liquid membranes, is very tied to how stable the substrate is, right? So I've got a few examples here. Reinforced concrete um, slab. Here we have some uh, CFC on a lightweight deck. Here we have uh, pumped in like engineered topping or whatnot going over a underfloor heating system here. And then my least favorite is a site mixed screed. Reason being for that, we have almost no idea what's going into this thing. We have no idea how strong or weak it's going to be, and how strong it's going to, how strong or weak it's going to be in different sections. Very inconsistent, right? So that's where I say that here, very stable substrate. Here, not too bad, but you've got weakness in all the joints. Here's a bit more, this is an engineered screed because before this goes into the pump in the truck, it's calculated and mixed at a certain ratio. Therefore, you know exactly what the properties are gonna be on that. So a bit more confidence and then very low confidence. So 
this is what you should be considering. And the reason I say this, obviously, is we're talking about underscreed, which is normally a structural element, um, versus overscreed. And it depends what type of screed you're doing. How confident are you that that screed's not going to crack? And if it does, we're in a location where your membrane doesn't have a bond breaker or reinforcing bandage or something like that, there's a good chance that your membrane will split instantly, um, almost instantly. So yeah, that's the first point. So here, I think this is a video actually, let me see if I can. It's an acoustic test, hopefully we've got some volume here. Solid versus the first one was very hollow. Second one was not. So it's written drummy on the on the thing here. A couple of pinholes there for effect as well. Um, so this was a balcony, reinforced concrete. Actually, they didn't have good enough falls at the start, so they put a, a leveling compound on, on top of it. Whether it was dirty or dusty or preparation or priming or whatnot, the topping compound hasn't bonded very well to it. And that scenario actually can be really bad as far as membrane failures. Perhaps not if this is going to be covered with a floor finish that's going to be protected, but I've seen some absolute horror shows on exposed rooftops where it's not a stable surface and over time and heat cycling and whatnot, the whole thing just pops off and deteriorates and everything just falls apart. Um, so something very important to consider. So I just wanted to show that video there. Cool. Okay. Point number two is protection during construction. Um, so this, what we're showing off here is the waterproofing membranes uh, being laid down and then it's had a screed applied over the top of it. So it comes down to sequencing. If the waterproof is coming in, doing their work, handing it over, potentially there's a gap between the trades there and whatnot. Um, that membrane perhaps in that instance is gonna be remain exposed for a, for a lot longer. And, and wet areas is one thing, but then also external areas might, might be another thing as well where um, if you were to go with the overscreed system, then you're potentially putting the screed down, membraning, and then tiling and protecting it straight away. So how you sequence things, I think, really is the, the question on this one and how much exposure you have and whether you can have the benefit of putting a topping over the top of it. Actually, one bit of a phenomenon that's becoming a little bit more popular now, uh, for whatever reason, is waterproofers actually taking on a screed package. Um, I'm sure tilers will want to fight uh, them for that. But part of the logic is to have a little bit more control as a waterproofer of their own destiny about having falls and, and whatnot and the quality of the substrate and, every, and, and even protecting your membrane. If you were to put a membrane down and then come and lay your screed over the top of it, it's protected, it's good. There's not going to be any issues when the tiler comes and lays down their ceramic. Okay, point number three. Replacement of damaged tiles. So one of the things, and this this was always a pretty big one for me because it came up a few times. It, it's common, especially whether that a tile cracks during the construction process because someone drops something and a tile needs to be replaced or even just throughout the life cycle. There's a big difference in how easy that tile is to replace, whether you have the membrane under or over screed. So Say you needed to replace the screed and uh, the tile and the membrane is underneath the screed. It's pretty easy. Rip the tile up, put a bit of a patch on the screed and place the tile back down. You're not interrupting the waterproofing system at all in the floor area. If you have it such as this on the, on the wall or a membrane on top of the screed, for example, as soon as you're pulling that tile up, there's a very high chance, unless you're extremely careful, and even often that doesn't matter, that you will damage the membrane when you pull that up. Then the problem is, okay, if we, yes, we've got a damage here, we need to do a patch. What's the standard way of doing a patch? 100 millimeter overlap onto the existing membrane with the new membrane. But if you've damaged it so much when you pulled that up that you can't get an overlap, it means you're pulling up the next tile. And then the next one, trying to chase that undamaged overlap so that you can do your patch repair. And then it's possible that you just end up ripping out the whole bathroom because of one tile. 
so I think that's a, a bit of a consideration there. Uh, next one, junction and transition detailing. So here we've got a, a bit of extract out of the standard. Um, depending on what, how flexible, how much elongation our membrane has, we'll often have a different requirement for how big the bond breaker or the detail needs to be in the corner there. So if you're doing an underscreed membrane, no problem. You're going to have a pretty large one, right? Because your screed's just going to come across the top of it and really contour to it, generally speaking. Um, however, if you then decide, no, we're going to do an overscreed system, your tiler is going to want to butt his tiles right into the corner. You can't have a nice, healthy fillet in that corner anymore when you're doing over the top of the screed because the tilers are not going to be able to do their job properly. Can I just, when you're talking about junctions, what about strip drains? Yep. Beyond the finish face of the wall tile? Uh, when, when, yeah, when you, you come across, yeah, when they've, they've got strip, they have, might have the 50 mil fillet tile with the junction, with the ceiling? Yes. Um, is that mentioned? You mean, so when so you have a strip drain, you would... The strip drain in the shower? Yeah. When it, when it sort of surpasses the finish face of the wall tile, it goes into the wall tile. Yes. So that's really not yes, allowed so anymore. It's not really covered in this one at yeah, all, but you can't do that anymore. Yeah, if you see a strip drain against the wall, non-compliant. Against, yeah. against the wall. Uh, it, well, yeah, that's even worse. Yeah. And the reason it's non-compliant is because there is a provision in there, and I don't have it as part of this one, okay. but flanges cannot, so you've got your cast in flange, right? That flange cannot be so close to the wall so that it interferes with the bond breaker and the corner junction. So by saying we now have to have that flange away from the wall, the flange does have to be directly below the spigot in the strip drain. That means you move the flange, you also have to move the strip drain. So pretty much any project that is compliant with AS3740 2021 will not have a strip drain against the wall. You'd have, at best, a 100 millimeter threshold tile there. Oh, okay. So I know that doesn't exactly answer your question, but it does answer it on the state of that should not be occurring anymore. Yeah. yeah. But you're right, in essence, that if you were to do that, then it can also bunt, bump into that detailing running vertically or, yeah. or around there. So, yeah. So. Just to elaborate a little bit more on that detailing, we've got some options here. You can use bandages. So this is a bandage. You see it looks nice and, and in the corner there. So it's not like a healthy triangle chunk of fillet. For, for a class two waterproofing membrane, you're supposed to be using a 35 millimeter bond breaker. So imagine a 35 millimeter, and that's measured on the, on the angle like that. So that would be a, what, it's about a 28 by 28 triangle. It's a massive to put in the corner there. So there's just no way you can do that by going over the screen. So then you may be forced to change to bandage detailing like this, which is, is fine, but it's something to consider, right? Because a lot of waterproofers don't like using bandages and there's just knock-on effects. If you force someone to do something they, they're not liking or comfortable with, you've got a higher chance of having poor quality outcomes, all of those sort of things. So a couple of things here. Here's just a, a nice detail on showing that, that curved radius for a bond breaker. Here's a, a cool little tool, actually. It's called uh, Cork Mate, and you pretty much put it on the end of your corking gun, and as you squeeze it out, you run it along and it contours the shape of your thing. Anyway, I thought that was a, a handy little innovation there to share, and then we've just got a measurement device here measuring the, the corners. So more to the point, I've got a nice set of photos to show you about consequences in a moment, but this sort of really just um, explains what I was talking about, right? Down the bottom here, under your screed, that's an acoustic underlay there, by the way. You could afford to have a pretty healthy corner fill in there. As soon as you start having something like this, it's immediately clashing with your tiles and, uh, and <sighs> bad things happen. This is a project uh, we, we had for a client where we'd inspected, put a lot of effort in actually inspecting the bathrooms, recoding them, getting the right thickness weeks before. Uh, our inspectors were on site and they just happened to walk down to the level below where the tiler was doing their work and they walked past this and said, hey, what's, what's going on here? Like this is a completed bathroom. Um, so they pull up the tile and they see this. And if you hadn't already read into it, what's happened here is the tiler didn't like the healthy fillet at the corner there, it was interfering with their work. 
So they just cut it and ripped the whole thing out. And they were in the process of covering it up <laughs> as the, the guys walked past. So this is also the shower area. You might look at it and say, well, that was just the entry door. You know, it's not that risky. This is the shower. All of the corking cut out, at least he did it neatly this time, cut out on both sides of the shower. So that diagram that I just showed, we'll go, let's go back here. This one here, this was ripped out, this was ripped out because it was interfering with his job. <sighs> Unfortunately, I don't think so. Um, they probably had a stern word with his uh, employer, as this guy maybe couldn't even speak English. But yeah, it goes, I think we know this shouldn't happen, but it happens. Um, so that's, that's where we're at. And I'm sure there has been plenty of defect cases like this as well, where it's been investigated. Why has it failed? Investigated. It was in the Tyler's way and it got taken out. Um, so yeah, just a couple more zoomed in there. This is where the water stop meets the wall. It was cut out there. So there's pretty much a pathway straight into the, into the wall cavity there through the uh, plasterboard sheet. That's it. So enough for that one. Next one, point number five, is bonded versus unbonded overlays. Um, <clears throat> so we know there's a different varieties of, of membranes and whatnot, um, and bonding to them, it depends on the product, right? So whether you're putting it under or over the screed is going to define what has to bond to it. And it can be easier to bond a screed to a difficult membrane than to direct bond tiles and get that direct compatibility. Um, so it's a consideration, and that's that's what I've sort of shown off here. This one, we've got a, a water-based membrane here. Um, falls are done, waterproofing is applied, tiles are direct bonded to the membrane, no worries. Next one, polyurethane solvent-based membrane, you see that really slick, uh, shiny oil type finish, that's why they call these oil-based products. Uh, historically, have been considered the high performing membrane. They are flexible and, and whatnot. So a lot of people still love these membranes and, and want to use them. Uh, and then there's also stuff that's a little bit more niche, which is, uh, this is actually a PVC, PVC sheet liner that's applied to it. There is no way that you can bond a tile direct to this. So we have, by choosing this product, and it actually will perform very well. You almost never have a leak if this installs is installed properly. However, you must install it below the screed and your screed actually won't bond to that no matter what you do. So you need to make sure you have quite a thick screed because it can't be supported by bonding to a structural substrate. It has to float on top and have self-contained integrity. So there's some... Exactly. Exactly. And that's actually one that we, we come across on this one quite often is we'll say because especially in class two, floor to ceiling height is everything, right? Like if you can uh, maximize the way you use that build up, you know, 10 millimeters on each level, that's a whole extra level that changes the feasibility of the whole project. Um, so having a product where you can have a 15 millimeter, and this is the tiling standard, a 15 millimeter bonded screed rather than a 40 millimeter unbonded screed, you've just saved 25 millimeters on every level. By, by doing that. So we, we often will highlight this one and say, hey, do you realize your screws are going to bond to this? Therefore, it's going to need you know, extra thickness, blah, 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 blah. Um, and there are ways to deal with that. You can have um, you know, bonding coats, tie coats to turn this into a bonded membrane. Yes, yes. Uh, just to, since we raised that one, good point, definitely legitimate. One thing where we see uh, waterproofers go wrong, especially because they, in their mind, they've been paid to do two coats. Now they've been told that they need to get an aggregate throw sand in the second coat. You can't do that because half of your membrane is now riddled with holes. Um, that uh, sand will pop out with plasticizer migration or, or, or whatever. So if you are going to do that, uh, first of all, do the proper compliant thickness and then do a thin additional coat and broadcast the sand into it. Often the additional coat is a different product as well. Certain Can be, yeah. Yeah, and often it is better to do it as that additional because the polyurethanes, when they have their plasticizer migration, the seed can pop out, and therefore anything that's bonded to the screen can come out. So using something like a, like a some form of top coat or an, a, an epoxy or whatnot that's compatible is a better way to go. Okay, bonded versus unbonded overlay. So similar consideration. It's just now we're talking about um, what's happening on top. Um, and whether we're trying to direct bond a tile to it 
This is just an example of a compatible system buildup, I believe, from MAPE. Um, and then here we have, I thought this was vinyl, but maybe not. I think this is the vinyl example here, and then here we have a, um, I think this is exposed aggregate floor finish. You guys seen those before? It was actually added into AS3740 2021. The diagram for, for that has waterproofing membrane under the topping, and then you put down a topping and you polish that. Uh, you may have gotten questions before about, hey, we want our bathroom to have exposed, uh, we have polished concrete uh, floor in it. And they're thinking that they're just going to polish the structural slab. Um, unfortunately, that's not per the standard and not compliant. Okay, delineation of responsibilities. Tyler, waterproofer. Uh, this is one that comes up really commonly with contract administrators because they're, they're defining, you know, well, what's the best way to wrap up these different packages for liability purposes? And probably a good example was the one I showed before where the tiler came in after the waterproofer, had no accountability and ripped out all their waterproofing. The tiler is going to be less inclined to do that if they're also contractually obligated to install and have the waterproofing system perform. Um, the other counter argument to that is tilers aren't waterproofers and waterproofing does have a lot of nuance to it. So you don't necessarily, uh, you're not going to get the best outcome if you have someone doing it that just thinks it's a side piece, just something they've got to get done so they can put their tiles down because that's where the real money is. You want someone that's focused on it every day. Um, so yeah, that's delineation of responsibilities in, in who does it. Um, and they will both have their preferences about doing under or over screed. You don't want to have a situation where you're doing over screed. If you've contracted your tiler to do the screed, then they have to go away. Then the waterproofer comes in a week later, does his waterproofing, and then the tiler has to re remobilize. And so that can be a, a big problem sequencing wise. <sighs> okay. This is an interesting side note. So are you guys familiar with the, the building bill that's been proposed and the changes in it? Okay, so specifically around waterproofing, what's, and I've been part of a couple of round tables and whatnot and consensus is positive towards this, is that the waterproofing license will transition into a specialist license category. Uh, so that means, and I'm not an expert in how the legislation works, but to me, it means two main things. First of all, the builder cannot now do waterproofing or, or have someone else do it and then sign it off under their license because it's a specialist. And also, it has been removed from something that tilers can do. First, before tilers could, under the tiling license, install waterproofing to an internal wet area that they are then tiling. That's been taken out as well. Uh, so that's a good little thing, interesting thing to know. Um, should hear more about this uh, being rolled out this year. Cool, and this is just what I said in the, the long form way. Um, so yeah, wall and floor tiling, um, waterproofing doesn't, doesn't include any waterproofing in wet areas, preparation of laying of tiles, which falls under the category of waterproofing. Okay, dampness, bacteria, and mold. This is actually a photo of my bathroom. <laughs> we bought a house not too long ago. It's, Old bathrooms need to be placed. We're working on it, don't worry. But the situation is that even if you clean this, the amount of mold in the, or the dampness in the screen and residual mold, it comes back within almost a few days, we found out. So the point that I'm making here is that if you allow your building elements, such as your screen, to constantly be getting wet throughout the life cycle, it's going to build up. And there's a lot of people more educated than I am on the consequences of that. But some say it's a, it's a real health hazard having that level of potentially contamination in your bathroom and acting as a reservoir. Like you can imagine that if you have your screed getting damp every time you have a shower, there's a drying out period on that, right? If you were to waterproof over the top of the screed, it's a lot quicker. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, you have to go on holiday or something for it to dry out. Uh, but if you have your waterproofing over the top of the screed, like we talked about with the accessible bathroom before, it's no now no longer entering the screed at all. And I, I'd say when you really think about it, and you can think about the actual longevity of a project, this is a pretty major point 
in how that building will perform when you're constantly having wet elements in there. Yeah, not very nice. It definitely does help. Like if you have your membrane down at the structural slab level and you have a one in 80 fall there, it will help water migrate out a lot better. Um, but it will still be a lot more dampness residual in that bathroom comparative to an overscreed design bathroom. Okay, cool. Here's a little bit of uh, Queensland government information on, on mold. So it gives a uh, information for public uh, housing tenants and it, it talks about mold growing and mold can negatively affect your health, blah, blah, blah. There's more information on here. I'm sure you don't need me to use your imagination that mold's not a good thing. Uh, yeah, more supporting evidence. I, I will read this a, a little bit actually. I can't remember where it's from, WebMD. Um, black mold particularly is uh, dangerous toxins. They're called uh, mycotoxins deadly effetin, et cetera. <laughs> no evidence to, to say that it causes it, um, but there's a lot of anecdotal evidence. So have a, a, a lot of friends in academia that are doing a lot of work around, and not just in bathrooms, but in condensation management and that sort of thing, talking about uh, you know, the effects that mold can have and building the case for it, because it's not strong enough yet to actually affect change. Anyway, well, enough about mold. Oh, there's some more just generally speaking about uh, on the ceilings in, in, the, in the wet areas. And see, this can all be latent moisture in the room as well. The faster you get the room to dry out, the better it's going to be generally speaking. This could be a window that's not even beside the shower. It's over there. It's condensation has built up. So just as a general note, doing anything to reduce the overall humidity in the room and having it dry quicker is going to be a good thing. Oh, here's a good one. Um, achieving the falls required. So, first one is if we're going to be applying a membrane at a different level, we know we've established that we need to get a fall at that level where the membrane is, right? First option, uh, we've got our reinforced concrete here. You see the guys, it's hot. They're trowelling out or, or moving concrete around on site here. It's difficult to get the falls, right? Like I know we all say it should be done in it, and it should be done, get the fall in the structure, but it's not easy either. It's a hell of a lot easier, as you can see this guy taking his leisurely time in a nice, cool in, <laughs> indoor environment, uh, knocking out a screed. So because it's easier, you can also have a lot more confidence that it's going to be done correct, get the correct fall and, and whatnot as well. So when you compare structural concrete to a screed, you can see there's, a, there's going to be a preference there because it's easier. So that's one of the considerations. And the reason it's a, an actual consideration is that things that are e easier to achieve have a higher chance of being done correctly. And that's what matters at the end of the day. Floor heating and acoustic. Um, I bet this is one that maybe not had come into your consideration profile for, for this sort of thing. But this is why it's actually uh, interesting because you, you do have an option with underfloor heating is to either have it down at the structural slab level and then place your screed over the top of it, or you can actually embed underfloor heating in your tile glue. So you've got a bit of options there. But this is really one I want to talk about. This is a new clause in AS3740 2021. So underfloor heating cables shall not penetrate the waterproofing membranes. Underfloor heating cables shall not penetrate water stop angles. <laughs> That's a nice one we picked up uh, on, in, on inspection here. Um, so this obviously waterproofing membrane is applied down at that level and, and thereby it's penetrating that water stop. See if I have another diagram here. Okay. So if we have our underfloor heating down, let's just talk at the structural slab level and then the screed gets applied over the top of it. If you have your membrane down at that level, you are going to need to pass your cable through that waterproofing, right? which is, per that clause, non-compliant. If we, and I hope I've got the slide here, if we then put our, see this red dotted line, waterproofing membrane over the top of the screed, we can run our cable through here because it is not penetrating the waterproofing system at all. 
So we're now compliant with that clause. And we also don't have an unnecessary hole in our waterproofing membrane upturn or our water stop angle. Um, so that's a good one. Cool. Next one, construction program. Um, I think this is really just intended to acknowledge the different ways things that can be done and everyone's going to have their own preference, their own set of skills. Some concreters now are quite confident that they can get a decent fall in their structural slab, whereas others don't. And they're going to be insisting on smaller pores so that they can do that. Um, there is that consideration there around, okay, maybe we do choose to not fight a losing battle. And I'm not saying this is my opinion, but maybe we just do whatever we can with the structural slab and we put down, we pay the money to put down the engineered screed after the fact so that we can go through our structure quicker. Nothing wrong with that. It's a different way of, of, of doing things. Um, but it's something to, to consider or at least be aware that someone else is going to be considering this. Oh, wall sheeting installation manual. So these details, as it says there, have been taken from the Villa board and the Giprock installation manuals. So what these are effectively showing here is that even if, just making sure I'm reading the right one here. So this is what these diagrams show is that the, the waterproofing is shown at these level and they'll have clauses in there around you need to do it like this or you're voiding your warranty, etc. And let me just see if there's another one here. Okay, this is what I'm looking for. The detail below shows a perimeter waterproofing band to protect the wall lining. So the idea is that those manuals, if you have a look through them, even when you're doing an overscreed membrane, they will still require this. I, to my knowledge, it's because the wall sheeting suppliers don't like a damp screed against their uh, against their product. It doesn't matter what the reason is there. It's in the manual. And if it's not done, you're voiding warranty and carrying liability. You have to be doing it. So now imagine you're in the builder or the waterproofer's position. Your options are do the waterproofing membrane under the screed to protect the sheet, or we do the over screed. But if we do that, we also have to come back and do full perimeter bandages. So now it's not a either under or over. It's if you're doing over, you now have to do all of this extra work with the perimeter bandages. So it becomes a, a cost thing, right? Like is the builder going to then or whoever, are they going to pay or do the extra work needed to comply with the wall sheeting requirements? Okay. I think we've just got a couple of case studies here to just, just talk about various scenarios and how things were done. Uh, so let's see if I can remember what to talk about here. Okay, this is a somewhat standard bathroom uh, in my mind. We've got central drain points here. We've got a drain point in this area. We've got a drain point here. We've got a shower. Might be frameless, might be fully enclosed. We're not sure we've got a door over here, right? So what are the, let's see if I've got another item here. So this is what this design effectively looks like. We've got waterproofing membrane applied on the screen, turns down into the, the drain point. Um, and that's it. We also have an acoustic layer here, which the waterproofing system is actually applied above. That's a whole different conversation, which um, we can have another time here. We continue across. So we started at the entry door with our section. We run through the first drain point. We run through our second one. So see here, we've got our waterproofing membrane turning up on both sides of the angle here. If we were to have gone over the top of the screed, we'd probably be having issues here um, with the way that these tiles butt up against the, the shower screen and whatnot. Um, and then we continue across. We've got a central drain point over and then the shower wall over the other side there. So that's one way of doing it. <sighs> yes. Yes, has to be. That's a... No. If, if it's an enclosed shower screen, then yes, which means it has that full frame. So the, the way the standard sort of talks about that is, if you can, then you have to do it. So if you have a, an enclosed shower screen, 
with a frame, you, you have to extend it up in, inside because I'm sure we've all seen the, what if you don't do that, water can just run straight underneath the shower screen, right? Whereas the way that these unenclosed frameless or semi-frameless uh, are built, you don't have that requirement. Um, and it's actually not a problem because the way that they're actually constructed is to have uh, sealant there. So if this was the fixed panel, yeah, it's going to be sealed. If you have the door, um, then that's not going to have the, the sealant there, but it's not necessarily a problem. Funny enough, the, the way this standard uh, talks about it is that you should have a set down here, um, especially in the 2010 version. It said, you know, where you don't have an enclosed shower screen, so it's a type one or type two unenclosed, you must have a 15 millimeter set down or step down. So it's very, very clear on it, right? And then if you just go down just a little bit more, where you don't have a step down, then you need to make sure you have a 1 in 80 fall in this area. With the logic being that if you have a steeper fall, it will shed water away from that door and whatnot. Um, but isn't that where, then where the dove should up? It's in the enclosed it's shower there. section. If you're having if you're having the enclosed shower screen type, yeah, because you. No, this is unenclosed. Yeah, no, no. I believe it's that's only when it's framed. Yeah, if it's a frameless, um, then that's when it makes you have a steeper fall in the internal wet area instead. It's not exactly clear. Um, and even I've already started to forget 2010, to be honest. So with, when, you, when you get <laughs> this scenario where you've got your beak where it falls that way and falls that way, yep. and the majority of time it's, it's not one in 100, let alone one in 80, um, and there's that, that distance from the shower rows to that peak yep. and the splash over point that goes over it. You're talking about if you don't have a door on it? Yeah. I think this is a bit of a can of worms. Maybe we'll come back to this one after we finish this presentation because that is a, is a tricky one. Um, okay, so looking at this, I think I'll just, just highlight that we do, in this instance, we had an acoustic layer under here. So what we opted to do was put down the acoustic layer. Um, and acoustic layers really, if you talk to acoustic consultants, they will say, should not get wet because then they don't perform their role, right? So you can't just put the membrane down and then put the acoustic layer on top of it. So in this particular design, acoustic goes down first, fully bonded, compatible membrane goes over the top, and then screed direct bonds to that. To explain a, a little bit more about how that was done, so it was using this particular product, this particular product that they had supporting evidence for that those elements did work together. Um, I think the reason was you, you don't need this acoustic protection when it's wet area over wet area. But when you have a like sort of offset floor plates and you have wet areas over habitable space like bedrooms or living rooms, that's when you need to be having this and it's become a lot more prominent recently. Okay, so that's what we've done there. Case study two, different scenario. This is the treat the entire room as the shower uh, scenario for um, accessibility. So what do our sections look like here? Well, motives being what we talked about before, we don't want the situation where our screed, an uncontained screed is getting wet because then the entire bathroom is wet. So what was done was to have waterproofing system over the screed. I believe the, the hatching in this instance is not acoustic, it's the tile glue there. So direct bond glue and tiles on top of it. We run through, we've got, oh, and by the way, this was also lightweight frame, I believe. Who asked the question before about we can't, we can't get a fall in it. Yeah. This was another reason why. So I should have read this at the start. Accessible bathroom with sh shower, single drain on a lightweight structure. So that was one of the other reasons that was chosen to go over screed here because if we did want to put it down at this level, exactly, it's very poss very difficult. You probably could get a top-notch chippy to do falls and, and whatnot in the lightweight frame, but it's so difficult no one does it. It's just not cost feasible. Um, so 
that's flat down at this level. The screed was used to get the fall and shed water to all to our drain point in under our shower. And you can see we've got our flange up at this level on top of the screed, which then passes down into the plumbing system. Then, of course, finally, our, our wall junction here. Um, you'll note that, again, we have it over screed and we do have corner detailing here and we do have a tile here. You can see how they butt into each other a little bit there, but it's definitely not impossible to do this detail, um, especially if you're having a class three membrane that uses a smaller corner detail. It only becomes a problem when you have a less flexible membrane that needs a bigger detail in that corner. Um, so yeah, just wanted to point that out. Again, you can see the lightweight structure here, which has no fall in it, and that lightweight uh, structure set down there, topping to achieve falls. So that's it. So what did we do product selection wise here? Well, because we're a bit uncertain about the stability of it, I touched on this substrate stability was one of the, the very first things. And I said that liquid membranes are quite susceptible to substrate cracking and whatnot. Because we had a lightweight frame, which is gonna use, move more than say reinforced concrete structure. And we had a, a screed for argument's sake, let's just say the builder was being particularly tight and they wanted to do a site mix screed rather than an engineered pre-bagged screed, we now have quite a bit of uncertainty on how stable that's gonna be. That's where this product comes in. You guys familiar with this? We, we call them like a hybrid sheet membrane. Um, so it's a, it's a sheet membrane, but the details are done with liquid membranes and whatnot. Um, and the logic is it's not as expensive as a full-blown welded sheet membrane like the Artex WPM 1000 and whatnot. So it was a bit of a middle ground here. And the reason we wanted to use that, because if we did get a crack under here, the beauty about pretty much every sheet membrane is that the internal tensile strength of that sheet is stronger than its bond to the substrate. So that means the point of failure, if those elements move, it will debond from the substrate and move. Liquid is generally the opposite. It will split before it debonds. So its bond strength to the, to the substrate is the thing that actually hangs it. So that's why in this instance we, we did that. Um, and actually, I, I take back what I said. There was a, a pre-bagged screed option um, for a bit of extra confidence. And then we had this sheet membrane run over the, over the top of it there. And that was the solution for um, this particular case study. And I might have one more. Ah, no. We're straight into the good part now. So you might have seen that this, um, this was advertised as the, the final solution, right? <laughs> exactly. Uh, the, the question is, well, how do you maximize all of the strengths of under or over and minimize all the weaknesses of under or over? The answer is doing both, but it's doing it in a very strategic way. And this is the argument that anyone that, that, makes, that will make the argument that you shouldn't do under and over, that's how the standard is read and how it's meant to be. It's because it can go wrong as well. And I'll demonstrate what this is here. Uh, I don't know what this is about, let's skip that. Okay. Let's just talk about this for a moment. So we've got an under and over system here, right? First membrane applied to structure, it's actually got nice fall on it here. Um, and then we have the second one coming over the top here, both of them terminating into the flange, on the flange, not running down the face of the, the screed here where it gets real ugly. Um, let's talk about how this would actually perform because the idea behind doing two systems is that if one fails, you've got the next one as a backup, right? Um, should function completely independently. Okay, in this instance, this is how it would walk, work normally. Water is applied to this area, hits the blue line, first layer of membrane runs down into the drain, happy days. What happens if we get a hole in it? Our first line of defense fails, runs down, and it starts filling up in this zone here, right? And it's trapped, and let me see, it just pretty much keeps filling up till it can't take any more. Exactly, but then you've got a massive swimming pool in the bottom here. What's going to happen? These membranes here, if you read the manufacturer's data sheet, yeah, they are meant to perform for a good period of time and are warranted where there's no ponding occurring. We definitely have ponding occurring here. So that's the situation we want to avoid, uh, among a whole lot of other things um, as well. Like the other option, I think, I don't know if I have a slide here for it. No, I don't. Um, is leaving the edge of the screed open. But then what you have is you're leaving it open so that water can't get trapped like that. 
but it goes back in, right? Exactly. And what you'll find is that those membranes, they are designed to work when they're applied to a dry substrate and water comes on top. Not when water comes in and wets them from the underside. They will debond. Uh, tiles will get drummy and over time because your whole buildup's debonding on the top then. Okay, so, so what do we do? Do we do neither of these things? Let's consider uh, an alternate solution here. This is just food for thought. Are you guys familiar with this type of system where you pretty much do away with the whole membrane and you line the bathroom with foam? Okay. I would suggest, it's not very widespread. Actually, there's just quite a lot of use of it in, in class ones um, for whatever reason. I just put this in here because it's sometimes good to think outside the box. I'm not necessarily endorsing this, but this particular brand, I believe it's Weedy, W-E-D-I. They've been acquired by Artex. They have Codemark certification. So they're pretty serious. It's a serious option. Um, so yeah, this is the do neither. We don't have under or over. We've eliminated the entire screed and everything. And we've just put down chunks of foam, which are watertight. And we're direct bonding a tile to it. Uh, yes, 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 they can be. It starts to get really tricky depending on what the layout of your bathroom is. If it's simple, then yeah. So this is an old one. Everything that you see here is made out of weedy board panels, actually. Um, this entire vanity is made out of panels that are glued together and it's somewhat structurally sound. And yeah, I just think it's an interesting consideration to make. And you might see more of this in the market in the future. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, it would be. It's effectively an insulation board and it's watertight. Uh, that is the same bathroom that we just looked at. Finished. What's that? PIR? No, I don't think so. Wouldn't do. PIR is terrible for water. Um, if I had to guess, it'd be an XPS, I think, or it's a proprietary sort of technology. Yeah, if you just go back, you'll see that they're actually a sealant. So see how they're like uh, stepped there like that? So you'll fill it with this sealant here and then you'll put them in and they sort of shiplap together. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, full one system. They have like proprietary flanges that connect into the plumbing system and everything like that. So it's reasonably well thought out for a conventional bathroom. Anyway, good little detour there on, on other possibilities. Um, oh, here we go, just a little bit more information with all the detailing. You can sort of look up all of this uh, yourself, but uh, it's a pretty decent system. Okay, now we get back to it. Well, what is the final solution? And the answer is we need to consider all of these things. This is the stuff we talked about before. What's the substrate stability? What's the detailing? What's our bonded overlays? All of those sort of things, we compile them all together and we arrive at a under and over screed system, but not just any under and over screed system. We wanna have fully functional, independent waterproofing systems at both levels, which means fully detailed, falls at both levels, fully draining flanges with a, a degree of backflow protection. So you'll see, I don't know if I can zoom in on this here. Yes, planned ahead. This is the key to it all, right? You've got what's effectively a double flange system here which will provide you really good protection from water, you know, easily coming down and flowing back into your screed. But at the same time, there is an opening there. So if there was a defect, say here, water comes down, makes its way right down between those two flanges there and into the system. So that's what, and I know there's room to argue on all of these sort of things, but as food for thought, this is a good way of, yeah, maximizing the strengths, minimizing the weaknesses, two completely independently functioning systems at both levels. Um, so effectively, that's it. And the key to the whole thing, and the interesting thing is there really isn't a proprietary set of flanges that allow us to do that yet. Otherwise, I'd be specifying it all the time. Um, so you sort of have to jerry-rig some different flanges together. And there's a few different ways of doing it. They don't necessarily have to slot all the way down inside like that. Um, so it'll be interesting. I've had this conversation with a few different suppliers. It'll be interesting seeing what gets supplied into the market in the near future. Here's a cool little demo. So this is, uh, I believe this is from Tremco's training facility. They mocked this up. So you see they've got a polyurethane membrane down the bottom here because their, their polyurethane membrane has been around for a long time. Everyone, you know, a lot of people like it. We've got a, a sand broadcast into a sacrificial layer here. 
Then we've got our screed, then we've got our water-based membrane that can support a direct bonded tile and all our detailing associated with it. Then we've got two different flanges here. I'm not sure exactly that would be a 100 millimeter flange and this one might be a 80 or a 70 maybe. And they sort of sit it in, inside. So this is just a good little demonstration in 3D in the real world. That's a good point. Like there, there will be some instances, like say for example, where you have the lightweight frame structure and whatnot, and you're not able to get the falls down at that level. Yeah. Um, so there, the, yeah, there will be some instances, but even say, say in that instance, right, the reason that you 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 would want to consider doing two layers is because you are a little bit uncertain on the the stability and the falls and whatnot. So. Yeah, I think it's there's a lot of different circumstances and there might be some times where you can't achieve what I said being two fully compliant, fully detailed independent systems, but maybe you have one that's almost compliant and then the other one's fully compliant and you've got that extra confidence and peace of mind. Um, I think a lot of advice what I'm trying to give here is for the people that were already doing under and over screed, thinking that they were doing the right thing but were creating problems rather than solving them, exactly. Thank you.